with uh, the future generation of Indonesia, uh, including those in New York and uh, the surrounding area. Uh, I've, I've given I've been given three sets of topics, uh, which basically revolve around the new power dynamics uh, in Asia, uh, particularly as uh, they relate uh, to the rest of the world. And the second would be uh, that with respect to, you know, how this technological innovations have shaped our lives and livelihoods and how they're likely to shape our future. Uh, and the third would be with respect to, you know, what we're seeing not only in developing economies, but pretty much across the world, uh, in terms of the widening gap between the rich and the less rich, if not the poor, uh, as empirically evidenced in the rising Gini coefficient ratio. Now, with regards to the first, uh, I think it's uh, safe to assume that, you know, China has been the motor uh, for the rise of Asia altogether. Uh, what we're experiencing today, uh, or rather what we have been experiencing in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, is actually no different from uh, perhaps the planet might have seen, uh, you know, from, you know, year zero until the year 1800, when actually the Asian economies predominantly made up of those of China and India uh, would have occupied more than 50% of the global economy. Uh, with the exception of an anomaly that basically took place in the beginning of the 19th century when the European powers uh, in their own uh, economy uh, started basically dominating the economic pie of the world. Um, it is safe to assume uh, that by way of linearity uh, in terms of the growth trajectory of the Indian economy, the Chinese Chinese, uh, Chinese economy and also Southeast Asia's economy, uh, plus uh, you know those of Japan and South Korea, uh, are likely to usher a new era in the next at least 50 to 100 years, where the Asian economies are going to be dominant, uh, like what we might have seen uh, until you know 200 years ago, and this I think has and will continue to dovetail into the geopolitics of things. Uh, and we have seen uh, how geopolitics has been somewhat more complicated in the last you know, five years, uh, if not the last 10 years, uh, because of the growing insecurity of the Western powers with respect to the rise of China and the rest of you know, Asia. Uh, and this is uh, not surprising. Uh, and this is, I think, something that will require time uh, for everybody uh, to get used to. I don't foresee a future uh, where there's going to be a significant degree of, you know, animosity. If not, uh, I think by way of the adaptation that every power will go through uh, in the next, uh, hopefully just five to 10 years, if not longer, uh, I think they will be able to embrace uh, the new reality, uh, if not the new era, uh, where I think... Uh, everybody from different parts of the world would have to you know learn to coexist uh, in amity uh, if not uh, you know as opposed to enmity um, this is i think an adjustment uh, which makes it i think very interesting for you all uh, to witness and hopefully uh, take advantage of uh, and and we have seen ripples uh, you know taking place in the south china sea uh, but I'm uh, an optimist uh, in the sense that, you know, whatever adjustments we're going to have to make going forward, I think would be somewhat shaped uh, by the framework that we had set some years ago in terms of the code of conduct uh, amongst the Southeast Asian nations and how they would have to basically, you know, behave uh, as per the code of conduct with respect to China uh, in the context of the South China Sea. Uh, to try to put this in the context of history, uh, we have basically been coexisting with China in the last 2000 years in a relatively peaceful and stable manner. Uh, as much as, you know, the Southeast Asian region has been graced by Buddhism for 400 years, Hinduism for 600 years, Islam, colonialism, Christianity, independence, democratization uh, for the last six to 700 years, uh, the region of Southeast Asia, 
as much as it's been graced by different, you know, religious beliefs, different convictions, different cultural influences, uh, has pretty much remained peaceful and stable with relatively very, very few bloodsheds, as I've, you know, alluded to, you know, a few times in different sessions. As compared to, you know, the fatalities that we have seen in other parts of the world, inclusive of, you know, those in Europe uh, in the span of 30 to 40 years between World War I and World War II, uh, more than 100 million lives, you know, have been lost. Uh, and, you know, I think the numbers are just going to further skyrocket if we were to go back to the Napoleonic era, to the Byzantine era, to the Roman era. Uh, these, I think, would basically give you a good sense of how the Southeast Asian region, which has not seen any more than 50 million people casualties in the last 2000 years, as a region of you know, significant peace and stability. And, and I think I would argue that you know, the peace and stability uh, would not only be driven by the fact that you know, the people in Southeast Asia are innately tolerant and moderate, but I think you know, China, you know, has always had a relationship with Southeast Asia in, in, a, in a very, uh, you know, commercial uh, and economic sense, as opposed to militaristic sense, uh, as opposed to what, you know, types of relations and relationships we might have seen uh, in Europe or even in the Americas. This, I think, serves as equity uh, for the future uh, for Southeast Asia and also Asia in terms of being able to preserve peace and stability uh, within ourselves, but also in terms of our being able to preserve peace and stability uh, with respect to other parts of the world, particularly the United States. Now, if we take a look at the United States, uh, I think the United States has been somewhat distracted uh, ever since 2001. Uh, that was a time when two major events took place. The, the first one, uh, would have been when China was accepted into the WTO so that it could become, you know, a major part of the global economic community. Uh, it has become a lot more intertwined with China ever since then. Uh, and the other phenomenon or major event uh, would have been uh, basically the 9-11 uh, attack on the World Trade Center, uh, which ever since uh, has distracted the United States uh, into unnecessary uh, casualties and fatalities in the Middle East, uh, where they have spent more than five trillion dollars, uh, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq and a few other places in the Middle East. I'm of the view uh, that I think the United States has come to a recognition that 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 should would not be the thing, the kind of thing that they would want to be engaged in uh, going forward. At this rate, I think the United States uh, will be in a position to you know, start refocusing a little more deeply uh, on its economic uh, wherewithal uh, in terms of strengthening, strengthening it uh, or augmenting it. Now, to the extent that the United States is going to be able to focus back on what would be good for the economics or the economy of the people and the country uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, I foresee a future in the next 10 to 20 years where there's, there's going to be some real interesting uh, you know, competition in a good way, if not in a healthy way, between the United States and China in areas of robotics, artificial intelligence, genome sequencing, energy storage, uh, and, 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 and various, and, and blockchain particularly. Uh, we have seen, uh, this, is, this is basically now jumping into the second set of topics which I raised earlier. We have seen in the last five years uh, pretty much you know, disruptive innovations in the context of energy storage, genome sequencing, robotics, artificial intelligence, and blockchain, uh, particularly in the areas of, uh, in the area of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, China has been much more bold in spending, uh, you know, more sorry, and more but, money. Hello? Uh, yeah. I just want to uh, touch in on some of the few key points you had uh, regarding our international relations before we jump into the industrial 4.0. Uh, you touched oh, okay. on a lot you of wanna... key points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you touched on a lot of key points on how the shifting power dynamics between Asia and America is uh, happening and has been happening before. And I do want to agree with you that U.S. has been uh, distracted for a while. 
So I just want to know your perspective on uh, what are what is Indonesia's role going to be in this uh, shifting power dynamic in the Asian century. I, I think what needs to be underlined uh, is the fact that uh, Indonesia has been way underrated in, in terms of its uh, diplomatic relations, in terms of its diplomatizing uh, with the rest of the world uh, on the back of you know some really really significant attributes inclusive of the fact that you know it is the third largest democracy in the world it is the fourth most populous country in the world it is the largest muslim majority country in the world uh, it is uh, geostrategically relevant uh, to not only asia pacific but to the rest of the world uh, the fact that it has not been engaged uh, to the extent I would have hoped for uh, in the context of, you know, what's happening in, uh, you know, the Middle East, what's happening between China and the United States, I think does present uh, a huge opportunity uh, for Indonesia to show its relevance. The only way to do that is to basically invest a lot more uh, in education. And, and this is basically an area where I've been an advocate for. Uh, in terms of not only focusing on the right subjects uh, so that we can get better and more educated, uh, but also uh, in our becoming better narrators uh, of our great narrative. Now, to the extent that, and this is not going to happen in the next six months to a year, but this is something that I believe uh, if we keep investing in, in better and more educating ourselves in the next uh, five to ten years, uh, I do believe that we're going to be able to hit an inflection point where I think we're going to be able to rise up to the, equa uh, to, to the occasion where we can actually be the bridge of communication, at least if not the bridge of diplomacy uh, between China and the United States, uh, the bridge of communication between Islam and the West, and the bridge of uh, communication uh, between Islam and other, you know, Abrahamic uh, beliefs uh, in be it uh, in the you know Middle East uh, context, or even more specifically between uh, the Hamas and the Israelis, or those living in the West Bank and the Israelis, uh, and those are I think some examples where I think Indonesia could uh, play a much bigger role in. Now, how do we get there? Uh, I've, I've been talking quite a lot about you know what what we have to do in the education space. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a big believer that. You know, we actually have to take a lot closer look in the quality of our teachers. Uh, we do not just have to take a look at, you know, the quality of our curriculum, the quality of the hard infrastructure of the schooling system in Indonesia. But I think we have to actually focus on the quality of the teachers. Uh, if I were to compare this with, you know, the quality of teaching or quality of teachers in parts of Asia, uh, including South Korea, where you know, typically the top five to 10 percent graduates of universities would opt, you know, for a career in education as opposed to going to work for Google or Amazon or Microsoft. Uh, by way of the fact that, you know, they do get compensated adequately and also the social status of being a teacher in countries like South Korea is pretty cool. Uh, this is not something uh, that Indonesia has, uh, you know, attained so far. Uh, to the extent that we can actually focus on streamlining, uh, you know, the kinds of teachers that would be allowed to teach at, you know, be it at the, you know, primary education level or all the way to the tertiary level of education. Uh, I, I do believe that we are going to be able to get to where we need to be uh, so that we can actually stand up to the Singaporeans, to the Koreans, to the Japanese and the Chinese and the Indians. That would be the time when we can actually project, uh, you know, be it the technological power, if not the soft power, uh, that would be considered as being relevant to, you know, how the new uh, power dynamics uh, between Asia and the rest of the world would be playing out. Okay, so uh, I agree with the education part. I think Indonesia could benefit a lot from getting a higher quality pool of teachers that would like have more incentives uh, so you did a lot of examples from Asia. So I would want to pivot to a topic of education in itself, and especially for the youth in Indonesia. 
So you said that Asia has a high regard for their teachers. You use examples from like China, India, and South Korea. So I just want to ask your perspective as a U.S. alumni as well. Do you think that as students right now, as youth right now, do we should Indonesians look for education like necessarily in the U.S. or should we try to move to Asia as well? But dari anak-anak permisi. Well, let, let, let me let me let me let me first ask you or you guys, uh, how many of you actually want to teach after you come back from the U.S.? Uh, personally, for me, I don't see myself as a teacher. Exactly. Right now. Right. Uh, the, the, the exceptions that I've been pointing out, I think, would include South Korea and China and Singapore and Japan. Right. Uh, India, I think, has had a bit of an edge over Indonesia uh, because of the legacy system from the Brits. Uh, and also, you know, to the extent that, you know, in the old communist or socialist days in India, uh you know being a teacher was a noble option right uh, i'm not sure if most of you if not all of you would consider teaching as a noble option right now you know most of you would probably want to work for google would want to work for goto would want to work for grab and all the rest right now i think mentally culturally we have to get ourselves uh to that point where actually a good chunk of you actually want to end up in a university teaching or sharing knowledge, a good chunk of you would want to teach high school or primary school. Now, if, if that does not happen, uh, I don't, I'm not so sure if, if we're going to be able to attain whatever we're trying to attain uh, in the context of our becoming a good international citizen. Now, in the context of whether or not we want to, you know, continue studying in the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis universities in, Ch uh, in China or Asia, uh, I, I, I still am of the view that, you know, the English language is still deemed more cool than Mandarin, uh, but it's only a matter of time when actually being able to speak Mandarin is not only a necessity, but it is actually a cool thing to know and to have. When that moment is reached, I think that would be the, po the point when we're going to see, I think, really scaling up of the number of people wanting to go study in China. Uh, as, as we saw in the 70s and 80s, we saw quite a bunch of Asian people, uh, you know, wanting to go to Japan to study. Uh, as soon as, you know, the MTV culture kicked in, uh, more and more people around the world basically wanted to be able to learn how to speak English. And unfortunately or fortunately, the education system in the U.S. is taught in English. And on top of that, you know, I think a lot of people are still of the view that, you know, the United States has three things to offer. Number one, demographics. Number two, you know, energy efficiency and efficacy. And number three, basically innovation. And, you know, innovation is happening in a big way in Silicon Valley and a few other places in the United States. And, and, and the view taken by, I think, the youth around the world, including those in China, and just take a look at the number of Chinese studying in the U.S., uh, they're, they're almost, you know, at 450,000, uh, you know, students from China. Uh, and, and that, I think, is reflective of the fact that, you know, number one, I think being able to speak English, being able to learn in English is not only cool, but it's going to help you internationalize. And number two, I think, you know, there's still a recognition for the fact that there's still you know, that, you know, marginal, you know, innovative uh, know-how uh, taking place in the U.S. I'm not nullifying the fact that there's innovative know-how uh, in China, Japan, South Korea, and India, uh, but I think it will take time for people to actually start gravitating a lot more to Asian universities. Yeah, okay. I agree with how I think the recognition of being able to speak English as a way to internationalize with other people as well is a big factor of why people would want to go to the US. And so I think from stemming from that educational perspective, I also want to touch on uh, work experience as well. I think I know uh, some people who are deciding to take work experience now in China for like not, not even work experience, just like MBA as well, instead of the US. So I think this shift is already kind of happening in between like today in current times. So you, I know you worked in the US before and also in Singapore and in Indonesia. I just want to know your perspectives on like regarding work experience in Asia versus in the US. 
Look, I, I think what I what I what I learned in the U.S., uh, be it in you know my public accounting days or banking days, uh, was was the fact that there was more intensity uh, in in a workspace in a work environment. Uh, that sort of intensity, I think, you know, put or tends to put people on the edge uh, a bit more, if not a lot more, uh, than if you're not working with with the kind of intensity that you know one would go through working in the U.S., uh, particularly in Wall Street. Uh, compare that with, you know, the, 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 the work, working environment in Asia. Uh, I, I got to admit that, you know, it wasn't as intense as it would have been in the U.S. Uh, that, you know, gave me, you know, the experience in the U.S., I think gave me uh, a bit of uh, an upper hand uh, when I came out to Asia in the sense that the, the intensity was not as high as that, you know, in the U.S. Uh, previously. Uh, but this would have been in the 90s, right? Uh, in late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. I'm of the view right now that, you know, there are many verticals uh, in Asia, uh, particularly in China, uh, that I think, you know, embrace uh, a much more intense uh, culture, uh, working culture, uh, than what I might have been seeing in the 80s and 90s in the U.S. Uh, that, I think, uh, serves, you know, uh, I'm not so sure if it, if, if it does justice to where we want to be going forward, but, but from, from, from the perspective of wanting to be, you know, more marginally productive, more marginally efficient and, you know, effective, uh, it, it could be a good thing. Uh, I'm not here to advocate that working more and more intensely is is a good thing. I'm just saying that you know, to the extent that you can work more intensely, uh, it 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 could dovetail into you know higher efficiency, higher productivity. May not be in the long run because you know you gotta you gotta you gotta be able to create balance in your life uh, between what you want to do as a hobby and what you want to do as a professional. Uh, but but I, I do believe that going forward, I think um, there's going to be symmetry uh, between what we might have been seeing or we might be seeing in the U.S. Uh, in terms of the working environment uh, with respect to that or those in, the, in, in, in Asia. Yeah, so I think that's a good point about how there's going to be symmetry in the future. I think before the U.S. work culture is super intense back in the 80s and the 90s in comparison to Asia, but I think personally for me, I think right now, Asia, especially like Singapore or China has a super intense work ethic as well. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, if you go to Hangzhou, if you go to Hangzhou, right, you know, there's yeah. this thing called 997, right? You work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, for seven days a week. Uh, you know, uh, in the old days of, well, I mean, even right now, if you're a banker, uh, you could be, you know, averaging probably two to three hours of sleep every day for seven days a week and for a few years. If, if you want to become a partner uh, at, at an investment bank. But now that, that that sort of like mentality has shifted to, to Silicon Valley, where, you know, your end game is, is not to sleep only two to three hours a day, but, you know, to, to come up with a patent or to reach, uh, you know, the first unicorn status or, or decacorn status or what have you, uh, whatever it takes to get there. So, so yeah, I, I think symmetry is going to be there. Yeah. Okay. So I want to touch on regarding education again. You said you touched on the quality of pool of like higher quality teachers. And I want to touch on how we can close like the educational gap that is present between maybe the richer communities of Indonesia and uh, the more like marginalized, marginalized communities. Well, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've touched on this in, in a couple of my lectures and talks. Uh, what, what we have seen by way of, you know, technological innovations is real democratization of the pipes of communication, right? You could only watch three stations, you know, CBS, ABC, and NBC. Now...
Uh, I think Pagita's internet has uh, technical issues. So I think regarding the questions here in the Zoom chat, there's a lot of good questions we would want to keep until the end of the event. And so just stay tuned and we'll, we're going to be going through some of the questions here. Uh, okay. Did he go offline? Uh, Nick, can you double check if he is in the Zoom? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, sorry. Uh, as, as much as we have seen a democratization of the pipes of communication or information dissemination, unfortunately, we have not seen a true uh, hello Station is about I'll... liberating your mind okay can you hear me now can you hear me now hello uh, yeah but Sorry. okay all right <laughs> education education is not about formulating your mind or mindset education is about liberating your mind or mindset right and you can only liberate your mind if you can democratize ideas so this is this is the paradox that we're going through yeah we got so many pipes in front of us you know through your mobile phone through your tv through your ipad and all that good stuff but you're not able to basically get the true democratization of ideas so how do we get there i i, I think it is upon us to, to make sure that, you know, there is a set of people that can actually set the right examples. Uh, and, and the leadership uh, shouldn't just be in uh, the, the private enterprise, but it, it could be and should be and must be in all enterprises, be it private enterprise, social enterprise, or public enterprise, to the extent that we have the right set, if not sets of leaderships or those in a position of leadership within those three verticals, private enterprise, social enterprise, and public enterprise, they can actually take advantage of the pipes so that you, know, you can have a true democratization of ideas so that you don't end up with the two extreme. Hello? Uh, it's important to not only be cognizant of what's out in the extreme left and out in the extreme right, but I think it's important, if not more important, for us to basically promote, if not augment, the center, if not centrality. Uh, sorry, but I think the last point was kind of cut off for a bit. Okay. So you Look, talked about the centrality of uh, education. No, no, what, I, what I'm saying is when you want to promote education, if you want to get people more educated or more richly educated, it's important for them to be cognizant of what's out in the extreme right and out in the extreme left. But I think more importantly, they have to know the center and centrality, right? And this is not happening, unfortunately, right? People so choose to be out in the left and out in the right without being able to communicate with each other uh, to the point where, you know, once you've formed an opinion, you tend to, number one, preach, number two, prosecute, number three, politic, right? As, as a means of justifying your opinion. And you're not supposed to be doing that, right? When you form an opinion, you've got to be able to show the kind of open-mindedness so that you can actually not only share the opinion, but actually enrich your opinion as opposed to preaching, prosecuting, and politicking. Okay. Yeah, I agree that polarization has been a huge uh, problem currently, especially as people are maybe going through their own uh, echo chambers in like the internet, like due to the internet. And yeah, I think I agree that we should somehow take advantage of the multiple pipelines that exist now to enrich our education. And I think there has been a lot of that going on already in Indonesia through maybe like the more educational startups like EduTech or maybe the online courses. So to go from there, I also want to touch on like the future of Indonesia, like 
how how do you see our the startups can push us to be more uh, maybe innovative or maybe you think like we focus too much on startups currently as a way to innovate look i i i think you know until recently southeast asia slash indonesia you know has not really has not really been on a radar right if you're a startup founder right thank god we had the amalgamation of tokopedia and gojek thank god we had that soundbite on what's going to happen with grab by way of spec thank god you know we had that soundbite with respect to what's going to happen with the traveloka spec right fingers crossed right fingers crossed in the sense that these three corporate actions i think have put indonesia on a map big time right i mean a lot of people in new york a lot of people in pittsburgh austin and silicon valley and seattle are not aware of southeast asia are not aware of indonesia but i think this is an inflection point where the Sorry. You know, it's kind of a holy shit moment for people with money around the world. And let's talk about money, okay? When we talk about liquidity, there is about 100 trillion dollars worth of liquidity. We call that M2 in economics, right? Most of that is sitting in the United States, Western European countries, Japan, South Korea, and China, right? And it's all being parked in instruments that are situated in the US, Western European countries and North Asia. right money behaves democratically and i think when southeast asia rises to the occasion when people know that it's a 3 trillion dollar economy it's 650 million people it is likely to be the fourth largest economy in the world in the next 20 to 30 years money is going to start flowing what we got to do is that we got to make sure that you know the investment climate in southeast asia particularly indonesia you know gets better and better right now why do i think that there is going to be a super cycle of technological innovations just take a look at some of the areas in indonesia that have not been disrupted you mentioned education okay education represents about 5% of the gdp so that's about 60 billion dollars okay and that has not even been scratched you know its surface has not been scratched yes you've got zenius you've got ruang guru but i think there's tons more that could capitalize on this space that needs to be disrupted even further and more deeply then you talk about agriculture which basically represents about 13% of the gdp that's about 140 150 billion dollars of top line on a yearly basis it has not even been scratched nearly as much as we should have okay then you got energy then you got real estate i mean in the us you 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 know all these you know platforms called zillow open door and all that good stuff that that have actually broken down barriers between supply and demand then you got tourism traveloka has broken down the barriers but you know international tourism in indonesia only makes up about 1.6% of the gdp as compared to thailand where the international tourism makes up about 18% of its gdp so you've got education you've got agriculture then you've got energy you've got real estate there on you've got healthcare you've got tourism i think the sky is the limit so if if you walk out of any university in the us with an idea that could be disruptive to any of these sectors i think you've got a good shot and basically further digitizing indonesia so that you know i'm i'm not i'm not against the idea that maybe in the next 5 to 10 years that we could see uh between 50 to 100 unicorns uh because of those pre-existing sectors that i've mentioned that have not been disrupted so that i think is the kind of painting that you know we can all draw you know in terms of how indonesia is going to break out into the technological uh you know uh, era uh, in the next 5 10 if not 20 years okay so those are very exciting times especially for current students right now
And you bet. You bet. Yeah. Okay. So I think you did talk about this just right now, but how should we, and I mean, we as in like students from all over the world. So how should we prepare ourselves to transition towards these uh, more exciting era for Indonesia? Because we are going to be the, how do you, like, I don't want to say it, but like future leaders. Hopefully we're going to be the future leaders of Indonesia. So I just want to uh, like see your perspective for the audience on how, how we should maybe disrupt or how we should prepare ourselves to Look, I mean, uh, innovate. most, most, yeah. I mean, many, many, if not most of the, you know, new graduate. Okay. Uh, what, what is so starkly different from what I saw 10 years ago, much less 20 years ago, is that most of these guys don't want to work in a bank. They don't want to work in a consulting firm. You know, they, 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 they would want to work at, you know, tech companies. And, and even more interestingly is that many, not just a few, but many, you know, would want to take the plunge by way of, you know, starting their own startup. I don't expect every one of you to, to, to set up your own startup, but, but I think it is a stark contrast to what I saw, you know, just 10 years ago, much less 20 to 30 years ago. And, and I think it is, a, it, it is a reflection of the fact that the young kids all over the world, including those in Indonesia, you know, they're willing to take in the risk for two to three years, you know, giving it a try and start all over if it, you know, if it tanks, you know, is, is okay. You know, I, I think it's more important for you to basically learn from the mistakes that you have made and the risk that you've taken that didn't pan out as well as, as you would have expected. So I, I think, you know, what, what, what I want to just basically advocate to all of you is that, you know, it is, it is an open world out there, you know, risk. And I'm not necessarily advising all of you to basically start up. Uh, I mean, you know, start your own startup, but you could actually open your mind by, by getting involved in any startup, uh, be it, you know, in a pre-series A context or post-series A context. Uh, right there, you can actually modulate, right? If you want to take risk. And if you want to take more risk, then you join a pre-series A. But if you want to take a lot less risk, then you, you know, join a series C or series G type of situation if you want to, you know, join a startup. But if to the extent that you, you do not want to take that kind of a risk, then it's okay to work in a, in a consulting you know, environment uh, or in a, in a banking environment uh, or in a, in a manufacturing environment, uh, it's okay also. It's even better if you want to go out there and teach. And you can actually be a teacher and do the tech startup at the same time. Uh, so I think the permutations are just so much more varied right now. And, and it's amazing that you are presented with optionalities that my generation, you know, would not have been presented with. So recognize that and, and recognize that, you know, taking risks is okay and recognize that your optionalities are a lot wider, a lot more, a lot deeper right now. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm interning too right now in a fintech startup. And Good for you. Yeah. I think what, I notice now is that a lot of startups are focusing more on social entrepreneurship as well, which is a nice, like nice moving forward concept. And okay, to touch on startups as well, you say how a lot of people now are more interested in more maybe tech jobs, technology jobs more than like commercial banks. So what are your pers like perspectives on the, the exponential rise of fintech right now in Indonesia? And how do you think that's going to change how people perceive uh, financing and how people perceive uh, maybe commercial banks. Look, I, th I think the, the, the traditional conventional tr uh, commercial banks are, are going to decline until and unless they make the necessary adjustment. I'm not saying that many of these guys are not capable of making the adjustment. I think many have been able to make the, the great adjust adjustment that was necessary. 
But I'm also saying that there's quite a number, if not many of them, that are not willing, are not able, are not capable of making the technological adjustment. Uh, I, I think they're going to be degenerative, right? Uh, now, for you to basically take, I mean, if we were to take a look at the, the, the financial services right now, they make up about 45% of the GDP. A typical modern economy basically has the financial services space making up about 100%, if not 150 or up to 150% of the GDP. So in terms of what could happen in a fintech space, I think a lot could happen. But is that more than the other spaces that I've mentioned? No, it's actually a lot less because the upside for the other verticals is a lot bigger at the rate that, you know, we've only scratched the surfaces of agriculture, healthcare, education, energy, real estate, and tourism. So yes, there's still a lot of upside in financial services at the rate that we are going to go from 45% of the GDP to 100% of the GDP, hopefully in the next five to 10 years. Yes, there's still a lot of upside in financial services at the rate that, you know, the financial inclusion is only 50%. Being able to go up to 80 to 90% of financial inclusion, like we're seeing in Singapore at 98%, will present a lot of upside. But does that upside compare favorably or unfavorably with the upside with respect to the other spaces, uh, I think it does compare unfavorably. So you've got optionalities. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I think we do have a lot of more options right now than we did maybe 10, 20 years ago. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong for me to sound like I'm promoting the private sector. Uh, more than anything, I, I think there's a lot that can be done also within the public enterprise and social enterprise. Yeah, definitely agree with you. So I think for most of the topics, we covered all of them. So I just want to pivot to like maybe advice for us university students. So one question we actually formulated was if you could, if you could like go back in time to when you were in university, maybe in Texas or in Harvard, uh, what would you have done differently going back to Indonesia? How would you, uh, yeah, what contribute? I, I, I would have started my own startup if I could travel in time, right? I would have picked up coding much more intensely. I, I learned how to program in the 80s, uh, but I gave up because I got interested in a few other things. Uh, I was more interested in music at that time. And I studied music and math. Uh, then I, I gave up uh, music and math uh, to pursue accounting. Uh, I did okay with that, but, but if I could travel back in time, I think I would have, uh, you know, focused on, on learning how to code uh, a lot more intensely and, and, you know, do my own startup. But, you know, does that mean that, you know, knowing how to code is a precondition for being able to come up with a good, you know, a successful startup? Not necessarily. Uh, I think you, you, you got to be able to surround yourself with people that know how to complement each other. So that's, that's the, that's, I think, the key for anybody that wants to succeed going forward. But yeah, I think it would have been nice for me to know how to code better. Yeah, I think coding is a hot topic right now. A lot of people are moving towards those kind of fields. And startups, yeah, that too. I think in Permias, we also have a lot of people interested in startups. So I just want to ask another question regarding, so this is a Permias event. So a lot of people are from U.S. undergraduates and graduates as well. So do you, what are your perspectives on the brain drain like phenomenon? Like if people do not want to go back to Indonesia, maybe because maybe there's better prospects outside. But as you said, Indonesia's prospects in five to 10 years will be much better, right? Like then much better in the future. You know, there was, there was a movie in the 80s called Sorry, but I think it's uh, cut off. This yeah, farmer who had a dream about, can you hear me okay now? It's, it's about a yes. farmer who, who, who dreams about building a baseball field. Uh, and, and within that dream, he had successfully built that baseball field. Uh, 
where he was able to get, you know, Jackie Robinson, Babe Ruth, and all the famous baseball players to come out and play. So the moral of the story is that if you build it, they shall come, right? And I'm not a, I'm not a believer of brain drain, right? Uh, I'm actually a big believer of if you think it's better for you to stay in the U.S. or China, Japan, Australia, Korea, Singapore, Europe for now, and if you believe that you know it's worth investing your time in those respective places as opposed to Indonesia, do it. Whatever you're going to attain, you know, wherever you're going to be in the next six months, six years, 20 years, will be applicable, will be value additive to whatever you're going to be doing or whatever you're going to be planning to do in Indonesia. And, and, and I think it is upon us, you know, in Indonesia to make sure that we built the field, right? And, and my point earlier is that we are starting to build the field. I'm not suggesting that the field is perfect already, but in areas where there's already near perfection in the field that we've built, that is basically an area where you want to come in and kick around and play, right? So I, I think it's okay to stay overseas, but it's also okay to come back. I'm, I'm of the view that now I think there's more and more Indonesians wanting to come back because of the announcements with respect to, you know, not only the, the go-tos, the grabs, and the travel locals of the world, but those that have actually attained successes uh, on a pre-Series A basis and a post-Series A basis. Word of mouth, I think, you know, goes around, and I think it's enough to serve as magnet, you know, for people who want to come back to Indonesia so that they don't miss the boat. Okay, that's a very unique perspective that I don't think a lot of people are having right now, at least from my experience. A lot of people are worried about the brain drain, which you touched on a point about how if Indonesia's current prospects are good, people will eventually come back to, which is a good, uh, good notion. So I think we'll move on to the questions right now from the audience. There's a lot of okay. great questions already. So right. one is from Melvina. She said she's from an education field and reports from the World Bank are in indicative of like incentive for teachers is not correlated with teacher professional improvement. So what do you think about the government policy on putting so many administration for teachers and like teacher autonomy? Say that again, teacher autonomy. Well, I missed the last yeah. sentence. Yeah. Can you, so can you repeat her, the last sentence? Yeah. Yeah. So her question was, what do you think about the government policy on putting so many administration demand for teachers and uh, teacher autonomy? Okay. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've had many conversations with uh, the people uh, within the Ministry of Education. I'm, I'm actually, you know, I've been asked to speak on Tuesday uh, with you know, at an event hosted by the minister himself, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're good friends. Uh, and I've, I've been open about the fact that, you know, I think uh, the welfare of the teachers ought to be recalibrated. But the recalibration, I think, ought to be tailored to, you know, qualities. Uh, and, and this is where I think the problem, I, I, I think less of the problem being related to the ability, if not inability, to recalibrate welfare for teachers, uh, I, I think it is a lot more relevant to, you know, being able to get the right set of teachers who want to basically, uh, you know, spend time teaching. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm spending a lot more time teaching right now. I teach on average once or twice a week, you know, at various uh, academic domains. Uh, I'm not so sure if you want to create autonomy uh, in, in teaching, if that's what she meant. Uh, uh, I sorry think, to cut you off, but yeah. she just said in the Zoom, it's about the Indonesia Teacher Certification Program. Right. The, 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 okay. Yeah. Let me peel the onion a little bit here, right? The, the education budget is about 400 to 450 trillions rupees, right? Trillion rupees per year, of which about 150 trillion rupees relates to accreditation. 
right? Accreditation is basically giving an accreditation to somebody who taught the previous year so that he or she could teach again in the following year, right? This, I think, is something that could be improved upon in the sense that the accreditation process uh, could actually be more targeted, could actually be more relevant to our requirements to improve the quality of teaching and the quality of teachers. Uh, I, I, all I'm saying is I, it could be much better. I'm not saying it's bad, but it could be much better. To the extent that this gets improved upon, uh, what will imply is, I think, the weeding out of the less good teachers, the weeding out of people that are of less good teaching. Uh, now, the question fundamentally is whether or not we would be okay with having fewer teachers that are of good quality as opposed to more teachers that are not of good quality. I'm, I'm actually of the former in the sense that I think we're going to be better with fewer teachers that are actually of good quality, if not great quality. Uh, I agree with her in that I think the accreditation program with respect to the teachers or selection of teachers for the following year, uh, at the rate that we're spending so much on it, 150 trillion rupees a year, uh, is, is something that should be, if not must be approved, uh, improved upon. Okay, uh, a lot of good points there. I hope it answered your question, Nalfina. So speaking of education as well, are, do you think the schools in Indonesia, specifically the higher education institutions like universities, are able to produce uh, good future outputs and outcomes in a global setting uh, when compared to uh, maybe other countries? I, I, I would say yes, but I would caveat it in that, you know, we're, we're not yet at the point where we're going to be able to produce the kind of scale of excellent teachers, excellent teaching that we might be seeing in China, Japan, South Korea, and India, and Singapore, right? And, and I think the first concern was what we had talked about in terms of the mechanism of accrediting teachers. The second is, I think, with respect to the lack of open-mindedness, right? I've, I've been making this point over and over again in past talks uh, in, in, in the sense that, you know, if you are a damn good teacher at NYU and you are from Ukraine and for some reason you fall in love with an Indonesian or Indonesia, you want to jump over to an Indonesian university and teach, you're not going to be able to teach because you're going to have to teach in Bahasa. And number two, because you're a Ukrainian, you're not going to be able to teach, right? As opposed to Vietnam, uh, or Singapore, which are a lot more open-minded, especially if they know that you've won a Nobel Prize, especially if you know that you know, you, you're gonna come into the classroom in Indonesia or their countries you know, with 5,000 patents. So there is no or not that kind of open-mindedness yet. Hello. Uh, is it my internet or? Additional space. Oh. So number one, again, we're not gonna be able to produce the kind of scale of good teachers and good teaching like we're seeing in India, China, South Korea, Japan, and Singapore. Uh, doesn't mean we're not ever gonna be there. I think we could if we were to basically review the accreditation and if we were to actually be able to show more open-mindedness. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, so open-mindedness is a big deal. I think... So, uh, sorry, let me, let, me, let me just add, okay? Yeah. Um, you know, a good chunk about, you know, 60% of the educational budget on a yearly basis gets decentralized to 500 municipalities, kabupatens, provinces, right? How that money gets spent depends on the quality of the regional leadership, Right. It's important for the particular regional leader to know the difference between OPEX and CAPEX, right? If he or she knows the difference between OPEX and CAPEX, there is a better chance of more properly allocating that budget for good reasons and for good purposes. But to the extent that they don't know the difference between OPEX and CAPEX, there is a reason 
for some misallocation of resource taking place in the regions. And we're talking about, you know, close to 60% of the overall educational budget being decentralized to 500, if not over 500 regional leaderships across the country. And that is a risk, okay? I mean, if, if, if the regional leadership, you know, is of sound quality and has good intentions of promoting education, that's going to unleash so much good value for education within that region. He or she does not have the kind of sound quality in allocating budget. There is a risk of misallocation of resource. Okay, so you say how misallocation is a big concern for our educational uh, qualities as well. And you also talked about how the open-mindedness for Indonesia's universities are uh, a big problem. I, I think I heard that in your Jeffrey Winters uh, podcast. Yeah. I'm a big fan of yep. yeah. We're, we're very, very passionate about that. Yeah. So I think yep. moving on to the next question is a bit, is a big pivot, but it's from Bill Nathaniel. His question was, uh, China is a valuable, valuable economic trading partner for Indonesia. Yet we cannot deny that it poses a valid regional and international security concern. So without being adversarial, how can Indonesia build a relationship with China that would be truly mutually beneficial and open better relations with the West? Because you touched upon before how Indonesia is going to be the bridge between maybe China and the US. So we have a huge role. Well, I, I think Indonesia has a, a lot more bargaining leverage with China than a Cambodia than a Brunei, just by the sheer scale. When you walk onto a table with 270 million people, you know, inevitably anybody would listen to you or whatever you got to say. We just got to make sure that, you know, after our having a seat at the table, we know what we have to say, right? And our trade with China is about 60 billion a year, right? China is the largest trading partner of Indonesia. China is the largest trading partner for all Asian countries, with the exception of Bhutan. We all know that. And that's going to stay on for the next 10 to 20 years, right? Just by way of sheer math. You know, the kind of scale we're seeing in the U.S., the kind of scale that we're seeing in Indonesia. I think the buffer between Indonesia and China is the extent to which we can actually preserve the position of moral, strategic leadership in the context of ASEAN, which we have, okay? We have been a big part in basically ushering ASEAN from a position of trust deficit in 1967 to strategic trust slash centrality as of today for all 10 nations, right? So if, if China were to basically try to do anything with us that may not be in alignment with how we think is cool, they're going to take a look at how ASEAN behaves. They're going to take a look at what the other nine nations. And I think we do have an upper hand. Number two, our relations with China have always been predominantly commercial for the last 2,000 years, right? And, and that, I think, serves as equity for the next 2,000 years. I'm, I'm not of the view that we're not going to be able to address, remedy any security issues or concerns that would involve Indonesia slash Southeast Asia and China yet. Uh, does that mean that we do not have to do anything about it? No, we have to make sure that we maintain the centrality of ASEAN and we got to make sure that once we reach the seat at the table, we know what we have to say. And this goes back to the earlier noted education point, right? And, and, and number three, you know, if you're a country of 270 million people, if you're a region of 650 million people, you do have the ability to basically swing, right? And pivot to anybody. So it is upon us to basically cultivate relations with other nations, including Japan, South Korea, other members of ASEAN, European countries, African countries, and North American countries. And, and I do believe that, you know, at the rate that we get ourselves to be better narrators, get ourselves to be better, more knowledgeable, we're going to be able to cultivate the kinds of relations 
with any country around the world that would basically help neutralize any potential security concern that might be imposed upon us by anybody, including China. Yeah, I think speaking of China too, we just recently passed the free trade agreement, like one of the largest ones in the world, the RCEP. Which yeah, I I, I, I was deal. one of I was one of the few that initiated it in two thousand eleven. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a one of the largest, but maybe the largest ever. So well, we, the, the the only the only downside or concern is that you know it was supposed to be spun as an ASEAN led type of initiative, but it has somehow been spun or perceived as a China led initiative. Uh, I, I I agree with you know um, you know some experts out there that you know it's it's good but it's not great in the sense that it's three miles you know wide and two inches deep. Uh, it it should have been maybe six feet wide and you know a couple of miles deep. Uh, but but it's a good start. You know the the, the liberation the relaxation of tariffs uh, and the recognition for things that are noble for you know all of us going forward is 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 a good start and, and the fact that india was given an open op option as opposed to the 18 month uh you know window uh, you know for the option to be exercised is a good thing because india uh is is a country of scale with 1.4 billion people and three trillion dollar economy uh that that would be a great inclusion to, to RCEP, uh, and, and it should not be viewed as a geopolitical plot. It should be viewed as an economic plot. Uh, un unfortunately, this has been viewed as somewhat of a geopolitical plot, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the TPPs of the world. Hello? Sorry, I was, I was muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying how China does have a lot of power, a lot of things, and maybe a lot of stay that we should be um, more aware of. So to move on to the next question is from Daniel Kurniawan. Uh, he's asking, should we, should we industrialize in a more traditional sense first uh, before talking about Industry 4.0 and uh, all those things? Uh, which direction should Indonesia as a nation develop their human capital, human capital especially the younger generation? You know, yesterday I was talking to somebody who's been spending a lot of time with SMEs, right? Small, medium entrepreneurs. Um, this person is in the business of advocating, uh, grooming uh, entrepreneurs, you know, be it micro, small, medium. Uh, the one thing that she told me that was a game changer was not where they went to school and whether or not they know how to digitize. The one thing that was a common denominator amongst all uh, Sorry, but can you cut off again? Signal. <laughs> Many of them. Hello, can you hear me yeah, now? Hello, yeah, that's hello? good now. Yeah, the, the, it's, it's not about where, which school they went to, it's not about whether or not they know digitization, but it's about open-mindedness, right? And many of these guys that have actually succeeded in the last 16 to 17 months didn't know digital stuff, right? But because of the open-mindedness, they basically allowed themselves to change, allowed themselves to make the necessary adjustment, including recruiting the right people. Now, if the question is in regards to whether or not we should you know, just focus on the traditional conventional paradigm. I agree to some extent because we're talking about 60 million micro, small, medium entrepreneurs, okay, that basically employ about 125 million people around the country, right? There is a huge need still to make sure that, you know, the vocational skills within everybody are there. Right. And the vocational skill. Uh, but make adjustments in order to survive, be it the pandemic, be it digitization, 
or be it, you know, shifting to, you know, a much more robotic type of, uh, you know, uh, circumstance. And, 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 you know, as much as we want to talk about industrial revolution 4.0 and getting ourselves to know a lot more about genome sequencing, artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, and blockchain, there's still millions of people in Indonesia that still have to know how to get better in welding, have to get better in doing the basic vocational stuff, right? And this basically relates to, you know, the point that I've articulated many times in regards to marginal productivity. Indonesia's marginal productivity on a PPP adjusted basis is only $24,000 per person per year, as compared to that of Singapore at $170,000, right? So we are not as competitive. We are not as productive as the Singaporeans, as opposed to the Thais and Malaysians. So if, if we want to basically move up the value chain by way of focusing on the traditional paradigm so that we get all these people vocationally reskilled and upskilled, we got to focus also on making sure that the productivity, if not the marginal productivity of these relevant people, you know, up the needle so that we can actually be more competitive. One big thing that basically moves the needle is the cost of capital. If you go to a bank in Singapore, you borrow, they'll only charge you maybe 1.4%. But if you borrow at a bank in Indonesia, it'll cost you about 10%, right? At the starting line, you're about nine points off, right? So that is a disadvantage, a systemic disadvantage, which I think needs to be erased, you know, as soon as practicably possible uh, so that we could, you know, uh, not only be more competitive, not only be more productive, but also, you know, move up the value chain by focusing on a traditional paradigm while also focusing on a new paradigm. Yeah, I think I'm on the view myself that maybe sometimes we are moving too fast for our own good and we should be more mindful of our uh, productivity as a whole. So I think we'll have time for one or two more questions. Uh, I'd like to touch on here from Rima. Do you think we've done enough in terms of transitioning to new and renewable energies, uh, like sustainable energies? Hello? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't hear the question. Oh yeah, sorry. <clears throat> so it's from Rima. Do you think that we've done enough in terms of transitioning transitioning to new and renewable energies in Indonesia? The answer is no. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, just just to be very candid about it. I mean, it's it's a noble thing. Uh, you know, we've tinkered, you know, with geothermal for at least a couple of decades. If you take a look at the tariff structure. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to pause for two seconds as I'm jumping off the car and I'll, 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 I'll unmute myself. Okay. Okay, so I think we're going to be ending soon with the questions, un unless there's Is, still more time. Can, yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, the geothermal sector is one where the structure is misaligned with the economics of entrepreneurship, right? Uh, for you to break even, if you're a developer or a builder of geothermal capabilities, it costs you about 13 cents on a kilowatt basis, right? Uh, made up of half of that related to your cost of financing and the other half, just basically every other cost that you got to pay up, including, you know, watering your plants around your building and turning off the, 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 the electricity at your, uh, and paying the salaries of everybody. 
Right now, the tariff for geothermal is about seven to eight cents on a per kilowatt basis. Who in the world would want to be in the geothermal space if you're losing money from the get-go, right? In Japan, I think they could charge as highly as 80 cents on a per kilowatt basis. Uh, you want to talk about solar energy. Solar energy has been successful in countries where there's been massive subsidization, particularly Germany, China, to some extent, Japan and the United States. Thank God there's been huge technological innovation uh, in the solar space, right? Where the absorption energy uh, has gotten so much cheaper, so much more efficient and effective. And the storage technology has gotten more efficient and effective where you've been able to collapse costs. So thank God for that. So Indonesia is not gonna you know, have to subsidize you know, as much as uh, it would need to in the past 10 years like we have seen in other developed economies. Uh, nuclear, uh, I think, is, is another example of scale, which I think should be considered uh, for and by Indonesia going forward. Wind, uh, it's pretty spotty in Indonesia. Not sure if that's going to provide scale. Hydro is going to be able to provide scale. But basically, it all boils down to the degree to which you're going to be able to liberate tariff, right? Now your ability to liberate tariff will hinge on the size of your fiscal space, right? And your fiscal space right now is limited. If we take a look at the tax ratio, it used to be at 11.9%. Basically, that's the ratio of your tax revenues with respect to the GDP. On a pre-pandemic basis, it has declined to less than 10% on a post-pandemic basis. And if you compare that with the typical OECD country at about 33%, you are coming to the table with a position of weakness from a fiscal standpoint. And, and when you've got that sort of a limitation, uh, you're not going to be able to basically consider incentivizing anybody that wants to be robust uh, in the renewable space. So I think we're exposed for the near foreseeable future. Uh, but the long future, uh, at the rate that, you know, technological innovations are going to continue to, you know, collapse cost structures, uh, I think there's hope for Indonesia. Yeah, there was a follow-up question to that question, actually, about how maybe there's startups in Indonesia in the energy industry. And he was asking about a bureaucratic red tape that will probably hinder opportunities for maybe energy industries to flourish. You know, there's always going to be bureaucracy, right? Yeah. During my lifetime, during my dad's lifetime, during your lifetime, right? And there's always a way to communicate with bureaucracy. Uh, I, I try to stay away from mentioning red tapes or bureaucracies. Uh, I think the more systemic uh, limitation is the fiscal space, right? Anybody that wants to consider doing a startup in, in the energy space uh probably would want to stay in the midstream if not downstream for now at the rate that you know the fiscal space is still limited it would not be able to incentivize anybody in the upstream for the near foreseeable future so by way of this exposure uh your your upside you know in the upstream is limited right in the renewable space but your upside is not limited in the midstream and downstream. So those are, I think, areas where you could actually consider, you know, doing a startup in the energy space. Okay. So I think we have one more question and I want to relate it to uh, like our future as well, like the theme of the event. So it's from Ruli. Many, uh, she, uh, they said that many pundits have noted that the quality of Indonesia's maybe democracy and commitment to eradicate corruption uh, has been in decline. This unfortunate development uh, may hinder Indonesia's potential for the future. Do you think that uh, we can turn this around and how? So maybe for the next generation as well that we should keep in mind about uh, like democ democracy or corruption. Well, you know, I did a, I did a, uh, you know, a conversation with uh, a monk uh, a few days ago, and he he aptly pointed out 
that you know being able to have and embrace the cultures of shame and fear you know is important in in limiting our bad behaviors right including that of corruption right we don't have enough of a culture of shame or shaming right uh, you know those that have basically committed you know not so good acts don't seem to be ashamed of what they have done right and and i think it boils down to the conversations you have at home at the office at school and within the ecosystem you know in general uh and in in terms of whether or not we're going to thrive as a democracy first of all i'm of the view that you know the democracy will not continue and sustain in its current shape and and i'm i'm a i'm a believer of you know anything that is a product of evolution right and and i'm of the view that i think democracy will evolve and i'm hopeful that its evolution or its evolutionary process going forward will take us to a place more cool than where we are today right and this takes us back to the earlier point of the degree to which and how quickly we're going to be able to democratize ideas unfortunately we live in an era where the democratization of ideas is not taking place as much as we want it to take place right and it's not uniquely within indonesia i think it is applicable in many other countries including developed and developing and underdeveloped so it is upon us to make sure that you know we use our devices for good purposes i think it's important not to look at tiktok you know as much as we have been and we use that time to read a book right the culture has changed where we're not reading books as many and as much as we used to long time ago and and i think the more we spend time on things that are noble and good the more we can democratize ideas and the more we can actually nurture democracy in a good way for our generation and the future generation and and i think we are at risk at the absence of being able to democratize ideas that we are mortgaging our future for the convenience of the present the case in point is climate change and i've been pounding on this point you know many times over in that you know amongst the zillennials and the millennials right within the conversations there's not a whole lot of conversing with respect to what we got to do to preserve the planet as it is if not make it better and a lot of people don't know that you know we only have 3 to 4000 gigatons of carbon left at the rate that we're emitting 60 gigatons a year we only have a finite life of 50 years if we want to continue consuming and emitting carbon and we seem to be doing that you know we keep talking about renewables but if you take a look at the pie chart it's still 85 to 90% occupied by traditional paradigm the rest continuing to be occupied by the renewables not increasing at an accelerated rate so that i think exposes us to a risk of you know continuing to mortgage the future for the convenience of the present so i think all these relate to our ability or the degree to which we can actually democratize ideas uh now we have seen polarity right a polarity between autocracy in china which seems to be able to show and promote meritocracy and a democracy in the united states which seems to be increasingly a plutocracy where the system of patronage in selecting talent you know seems to be getting more and more and unfortunately in countries like indonesia we're seeing a democracy where the selection of talent you know involves quite a high degree of patronage you know where political appointees are on the rise as opposed to technocratic appointees that i think dilutes the value proposition of you know whether or not we're going to be able to stay on as a good democracy because a good democracy should be 
a democracy that will be able to continue selecting talent on a meritocracy basis or on a merit basis as opposed to on a patronage basis, that I think exposes us to risk. Now, it's upon us and it's upon you guys, the younger generation, to actually recognize that as an exposure to a risk and deal with it in a constructive manner. And I, I, I think if we did, by way of further democratizing ideas and focusing more on making sure that meritocracy is becoming a richer part of our continuing as a democracy, I think we'll have a pretty good future. Okay, well, I think that's as any good endpoint there will be. And yeah, I just want to thank you for your time. It was a really great discussion for everybody here. I do agree that maybe democracy does hinge on the education and the accountability of people chosen above. And yeah, uh, Salma, you want to do the closing? Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you so much, Pagita, for sharing your insights today and also everybody else for attending this event on a Saturday morning or Friday night. I know that a lot of you would probably um, prefer to be somewhere else tonight doing something a bit more like quote unquote fun. Um, but I personally learned a lot and I know um, from the organizers, we've actually been talking behind the scenes just about how amazing this talk has been. Uh, and we hope that all of you were able to learn something from this event as well. And specifically how we can all actually contribute to the growth of Indonesia in the future and the key points that we have to really focus on. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again in future Burmese national initiatives. And before we conclude the event, we'd actually like to take a picture with all of you. So if you can all just like turn on your videos, um, we'll take a screenshot and then y'all can go. Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds for everyone to come in. Um, we have two pages, so we'll do the first one then move on to the second one. Okay, would anyone else like to turn on their videos? Mm -hmm. Okay, so three, two, one. And then second page, three, two, one. All right, thank you so much everyone once again and I hope you all have all right. a good weekend.